Good evening, everyone. I'm Masoud Mohsani, a research scientist at Google Quantum AI Lab. I would like to thank the organizer for invitation and making this live stream presentation happening today. Today, I'm going to announce the launch of TensorFlow Quantum, which is an open source framework for quantum machine learning. I would like to mention that in this talk, I do not assume any background in quantum physics or quantum computing. I would like to start with a famous quote from Richard Feynman that he made in 1982 that is considered as the first a deep observation on quant computational power of quantum systems. He said that nature is unclassical, damn it. So if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. So, of course, we should know that machine learning is not about exactly simulating systems, but has the ability to learn a model of system and predict systems behavior. So I would like to rephrase Feynman's quote as, nature isn't classical, damn it. So if you want to make a model of nature or learn a model of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. So with that in mind, we developed TensorFlow Quantum, basically as toolbox to model natures and also artificial quantum systems. So what are the main objectives for TF Quantum? It's the first one is a software framework for hybrid quantum, quantum classical machine learning under TensorFlow and CERC. And it allows researchers to perform fast prototyping, training, inference, and testing of quantum models for quantum data, which can reduce the prototyping time from weeks to hours. Also, it can help machine learning and quantum computing researcher to discover new algorithms for near-time devices or ultimately for fault-tolerant quantum computers once they become available. So, for people who have no background in quantum physics, I would like to make an introduction to quantum mechanics, quantum computing, and quantum machine learning in just one slide. So, are you ready? So this is the setting that we want to discuss. This is known as a double slit experiment, and it's at the heart of the quantum mechanics. So let's consider that you have a ball machine. Uh, if you have played tennis, you know that, like how it works. You can set it up to send random balls. And if you have a wall with two slits, so that some of the balls can go through the slits, and you have a, another wall, like a, as, or a screen, that you can detect where these balls are hitting. So what are your expectations of the probability distribution that balls can hit the screen? So there are two possibilities, balls going from the top, uh, correspond to orange slit, uh, and you see a, a curve, a, a bump, uh, correspond to that. And there is another one for if they go through bottom slit. And the joint of probability distribution is just summing over all two events. That's all you need to do. So what happens if the, uh, the source for these particles is quantum mechanical. So I assume if you have electron guns that sends electrons, or if you have a laser to send photons, these are the particle of light. And if you have like a double slit setting, and double slits are obviously very smaller, and then you have a screen and see, you, you want to see where these uh, particles are hitting. And now you can see that there is going to be an interference pattern emerging that is very bizarre. So here, instead of that uh, Gaussian distribution right in front of each slit, you have this interference pattern that sometimes even right in front of the slit, there is zero chance of getting a particle. And so this was very positive for physicists uh, back more than 100 years. And uh, until they realized that actually there is a quick fix to this, you can, all you need to do is just generalize the classical property distributions to quantum. And what, for that, you just attribute a property amplitude instead of a property, and then uh, that's a complex number. And so for two events, you have to just add them up and then square them. And when you square, there's a new term appearing. Instead of like the, the properties of getting through the slit top or bottom, there's an interference term. This is the third term. And this is related to the relative phase between these events. And you can manipulate this, and by manipulation of that, basically you can do computation. That's the core idea of quantum computing. And how do you do that? You place a, a stack of the walls at various different distances, and you place the slits at various different locations, and you set it up to sample from a property distribution. So you create a constructive interference pattern 
to generate distributions that is the desired outcome. Now, that basically is quantum computing. So congratulations, you've learned how quantum computation works. So uh, let's look at a specific example that's pretty interesting. If you have random walls uh, separated in different uh, places and random slits and, uh, uh, located in these walls, you get a fancy property distribution and is known as a Porter Thomas. It means that like, you have basically a quantum chaotic system. And this is sampling from the distribution of the system is exponentially hard classically. And this was at the heart of the quantum supremacy experiment that we announced last year. Uh, basically, this is uh, the rich computational uh, setting already. Of course, that particular uh, setting is not scalable, but that's a technical detail. All I want to say is that you can basically even set up a quantum machine learning now on this. So how do we do that? We parameterize this arrangement. So we allocate or attribute parameters to each slit's uh, location and then try to learn to generate an desired output property distribution function. Or iteratively learn to create a set of solutions that are the correct solution to your computational problem. And that's at the heart of the quantum machine learning. So you just basically learn all the concepts I want to introduce in this talk, except you know, this setting is not a scalable, so the rest of the talk is about a scalable implementation and how we can code it over TensorFlow. So, to, to push the analogy a little bit further, you have to think about generating or engineering these interference patterns is like generating sound waves. Like it's like you are composing uh, and playing and, uh, uh, music. And uh, so there are certain you know, strings, and the strings here becomes qubits. And instead of the note, you have quantum gates. Here is like a two qubit gates. Uh, illustrated here. And instead of the musical instruments, you have this control microwave by electronics where you can generate electrical waves that generates these property distributions that correspond to the wave nature of the particles. So we did this at Google. So over the uh, past five, six years, we have developed these uh, uh, superconducting technologies uh, that you can fabricate these qubits at a scale. Uh, and uh, so this is a particular uh, picture of a 1D arrangement of this superconducting qubits that could be a ring, uh, and there's a pair of electrons that uh, it's a current in that uh, uh, qubit that can go either clockwise or counterclockwise. But when it's quantum mechanical, it can be in superposition of both uh, direction and goes in both way. And this is like going through, uh, the particle going through a slit and, uh, at the same time. And you can control it here with the electrical gates. And this has to be low enough temperature for this superposition to happen. That's below a critical temperature of superconductivity. That's the reason we place it in a dilution refrigerator at 100 millikelvin. So we use that device with a 53 qubit processor to uh, implement a random a set of random quantum gates and showing that it's very hard to sample them classically. So let's back up a little bit and see what, what are these quantum bits. Quantum bits basically you can place uh, uh, and present them as like a vector in a, a bracket sphere. So basically if you consider this as a globe, if it's a classical bit, it's either pointing at North Pole or South Pole. For a quantum uh, bit, it can be any point on this globe. So there are certain properties of classical bits uh, that you can always, uh, they always have a value of 0 of 1. It can be copied. Uh, their state doesn't change if, you, if they are measured. And measuring one bit doesn't affect other unmeasured bits. And none of them actually in general works for quantum bits. So the challenge is how we can actually manipulate quantum information and how we can do quantum computation. So in order to do that, you can build arbitrary single qubit operation by just rotations around two fixed axes. And uh, this can make a rotation anywhere in that uh, globe, basically. And to, to do arbitrary universal quantum computation, all you need to add is to add a single non-trivial two qubit operation, which is like here is CNOT. That means that if the first bit is uh, one, the second one is flipped. And 
uh, quant understanding quantum circuit as well composing music is like there are these different strings correspond to qubits, so they're placed in a space, and in time you print the, the kind of things, operations you do, which has various different single or two qubit rotation. At the end, you just measure them to create classical probability distributions, and that's always, you know, means for each bit is either one or zero, like classical bits. The thing is that these outcomes are normalized, so they sum to one. So, what is the landscape of near-term quantum computing today uh, with this kind of technology? So basically right now, if to, to quantify computational power of this system, you have to consider two index. One is the number of qubits, one the quality of the qubits. So you, to, to, to have maximum computational power, you need to have high quality qubits, a lot of them. So in that shaded purple, uh, shaded purple area, if you're there, it means that above the dash line, basically things are not interesting because uh, although you have a lot of qubits, they can be simulated classically, basically because the state of the quantum computer is localized. Uh, so it does not have this exponential power built into it. So below that dash line where the, we actually, uh, on Sycamore, we observe this quantum supremacy, things become interesting. But to have fault-tolerant quantum computer, you need on the order of millions of qubits, on tens of millions, to do like something like Shor's algorithm that you can use it to basically uh, uh, decode a uh, crypto system, and uh, it's for lo factoring large numbers to prime factors. But that's kind of one, one extreme point. In near-term quantum devices, you can actually think about on the order of tens to thousands of qubits, uh, still there are potential opportunities to do something interesting like quantum machine learning that cannot be classically done, especially when you want to analyze or distill quantum data. And th this is where TensorFlow Quantum comes in. As a toolbox in this area that was not uh, available and we are introducing it this week. So how can we do machine learning over these parameterized quantum circuits? So, to here, to see a particular uh, analogy, you have to notice that when you print this kind of unitary operations or random rotations in a space, time, volume that you have, this is a kind of continuous parameterized rotation which uh, mimic kind of as classical circuits uh, like deep neural networks that map certain input to output. So that's the reason for the term quantum neural networks that you might have heard. But how do we create these parameterized quantum circuits? Let's look at a concrete example. So we use here SIC. This is a toolbox introduced by a team for simulation of quantum uh, circuits. So we import SIC, we import SIMPI, and next we write a parameterized quantum circuit for this particular uh, processor on the right, which is Sycamore, which is basically the SIC here in this setting is like acting as a quantum computing assembly language. We will use SIMPI for adding symbolic parameters to our circuit. We define a qubit for our circuit using the six qubit, a grid qubit command, which place a qubit on the corner here. This command can take uh, coordinates of qubits on the grid. We place it on the corner at zero, zero coordinate, and then we can try to build a simple model. What would be that simple model? It's a parameterized quantum circuit with one gate using circ.circ. And then it's just a rotation by an angle theta about some y-axis of the qubit. To simulate the circuit, we actually need to attribute values to this symbol theta. This can be done by circ parameter resolver. And then we pass the circuit to a circ simulator object obtained that can obtain the resulting output vector. So the output is actually a vector that just speed it out. Now all we need to do to get the classical uh, values from this wave function is to define a measurement. Here we choose a standard Pauli Z operator which measures if the qubit is zero or one. The expectation value of the measurement is obtained by calling the expectation from wave function command on the simulator output. So how can we do machine learning on this uh, finite space times that we have available? So that was an introduction to say to just set up a parameterized model. But you have to notice for quantum machine learning, we should upload the data. Basically, we have to prepare it on the fly. This is the first part of a circuit. This is a 2D array that you can see. That first part is like 
basically generating the data on the fly, and second one is the parameter seekers to try to learn it iteratively using measurement outcomes. So I mentioned quantum data. What one might ask, what are the possible sources of quantum data? Basically, whenever you have a quantum computer, the output states of a quantum computer is quantum data. So you can use quantum machine learning for verification, doing inference over that output, and discover new algorithms. In particular, for simulation of chemical systems or simulation of quantum many-body systems. In particular, when we have this quantum matter near a quantum critical point, the entanglement or these correlations diverges exponentially, and so it becomes very hard to simulate them at that point. So, what what are the other cases? Are quantum communication networks, basically in quantum repeaters, quantum uh, receivers, purification units. Basically, when you have data in, and communication networks, it, the networks are noisy, and you have to distill and improve it, uh, improve the quality, and you can machine learn that. You can improve quantum metrology, which is like sensing imaging, basically high performance measurement. Or also control quantum devices. Uh, this is important for near-term devices uh, to avoid uh, you know, or mitigate errors. The simplest possible case for quantum data is just for a single qubit. Basically, you can have two cloud of the data for the blue and orange correspond to two vectors, you know, pointing at two different directions. But the, the things could be noisy. So it's, it's when you have a data set, it could be any point near the, to that direction, but not exactly there. So the question is that if someone gives you that data, can you do a binary classification? And this is the examples, the hello world examples. I'm, I'm going to uh, walk through it today. So. As a concrete uh, algorithm for doing quantum machine learning is variational quantum algorithms. Basically here we have two different core processors, a CPU and QPU that talk to each other. What happens is that QPU, you run it, you cl collect some classical distribution of data and just pass it to, uh, to CPU to come up with better suggestion for the parameters. And you do this iteratively to converge. And this is basically the uh, iterative quantum classical optimization. But you can do more interesting stuff. Why not just co combine quantum classical deep neural networks to build hybrid models? Here, you, you use the best of both models to, to increase uh, or reach, become, uh, develop richer uh, representation to capture some unknown data. And also, you can improve generalization. But how do we do that? We all know already TensorFlow is the most, uh, one of the most uh, used machine learning platform, and Circuit is also one of the widely used uh, circuit simulator for quantum circuit. Can we combine them, and what are the challenges for that? Once you start to looking into this problem, you realize there are certain technical hurdles. For example, quantum data cannot be imported, uh, so you have to generate it on the fly. And also, you need to have uh, both data and the models are layers in these quantum circuits, and you have to basically be, have a way to build these highly uh, non-trivial computational graphs that, that are non, uh, dynamic. So the, the other hurdle is that you need to pass this uh, the quantum program to a QPU at one time. So you cannot just do computational graph, do measurements, and just pass it. Every time there is a delay, there is a, a latency between QPU and CPU because QPU works at a few microseconds, uh, including measurement. And there are other issues with sending batches of jobs uh, to realize many parallelized uh, quantum circuits. And uh, considering all those hurdles, we arrived at four design principles. First, we, we have to support differentiation of quantum circuits and hybrid backpropagation if you want to build hybrid models. Also, the circuit batching, which is, um, we mean, that we have to be able to generate quantum data on the fly and train over so many different quantum circuits in parallel. Also, there is an uh, issue that we need to be back and uh, agnostic. But it means that we should be able to switch from a simulator to a real device with few changes, so we, especially for theories, so they can try a lot and then they can compare their simulation against an actual hardware uh, real output. So, and the final principle is the minimalistic uh, nature of uh, our approach, is that we want to build a bridge between CIRC and TF, TF, not necessarily to reinvent the wheel. So we don't want to force the developer to, to learn new toolbox uh, that is different, so much different from TF and CIRC. 
So with that, we arrived at this software architecture. It's basically very simple. We map everything to tensors, and then uh, we use this kind of ops on a TensorFlow framework to calculate or classical property distributions for the output. So basically, here you can see an example that uh, uh, a circuit can become a tensor, the parameters that describe a quantum circuit is, is a tensor, or poly operators are tensors. And also we can have, from some ancestry nodes, getting some particular suggestion for the parameterized uh, value to instantiate that, and then becomes the operations that you calculate the expectations, and then you can feed forward it to other nodes in the computational graph. So with that, we can look at the software stack as a whole. So at the user interface, there are two sets of data. It's, data could be classical or quantum, so the TF quantum now support quantum data. But the interesting thing is that the quantum data, as I said, it's like either circuits or operators, but you can map everything to tensors and then use a standard TF uh, layer, TF class high level uh, layers that uh, you can manipulate them. So at, below that, you can see this TFQ layers and differentiators, and below, just below that is the, the TFQ ops that they can run a simulator like Cirque or this uh, more high performance simulator that we just launched this week, as, uh, known as QSIM. Or you can run it on actual hardware, which is QPU. The classical part of the model can be run on CPU, GPU, or TPU as a standard TF uh, basically framework allows you to do. So to see a particular uh, uh, concrete suggestion uh, for, to understand how this framework works is like looking at the pipeline for a hybrid discriminative model. Here you can see the interaction between different parts, like quantum data preparation, evaluation of quantum models, and then once you measure it, then the data becomes classical. Then you can feed it forward for further post-processing by a classical neural network. And then you can measure cost on cost function, feed it back to improve the parameter. Now you can improve the parameter of both quantum model and the classical neural network. And this is basically the nature of the hybrid model. So with that, we are now ready to do a hello many world examples. So this notion of many words, this comes from an interpretation of quantum mechanics known as many word interpretation. And I'm not necessarily identified with that, but it's kind of an interesting way of looking at uh, the simplest possible case for uh, uh, analyzing quantum data would be a binary classification for a single qubit. So how can we do that? So here, again, as before, we import circ and simpy and place qubit on the grid. We also import numpy TensorFlow and TFQ packages. The first to do is setting up the labels and parameters for preparation of our quantum data. And then, then we, for simplicity here, we classify just two data points, A and B, correspond to two vectors on the block sphere. Then we can convert these vectors to tensors. And with that, we can uh, have, we, we already generated our quantum data, now we need to build our hybrid classifier. And in order to do that, we apply a core uh, TFQ functionality and that enables us to, easy, uh, to have an easy integration with uh, TensorFlow. So the data inputs to our hybrid model can be uh, specified using standard cross input object. The quantum portion of our model begins with um, with a parameterized rotation about the y-axis, and then our hybrid model will learn that to discriminate to the states by optimizing the theta parameter. To calculate the loss function, uh, to basically um, learn this, uh, we need to uh, convert the quantum states into classical information. We can do this by making a measurement along the axis, and we embed our quantum model and measurement into a cross model. We use the TFQ PQC layer, and this layer enhanced from the TF Keras layer as, uh, so it's compatible with Keras API. For the last stage of the classifier, we attach two basically unit dense uh, um, layer with softmax activation. And then the, the layers are ready to, to to basically use the result of measurement to predict the properties that the input data point is uh, 
either from class A or class B. To train the model, we wrap our classical and quantum layers in a chaos model. The weights in the dense classical layer and the parameters in the quantum models have both updated using Adam optimizer with the loss defined by, with the categorical uh, cross entropy. We see that the loss is quickly driven towards zero during the training. Now we can apply this uh, classifier uh, that we built for uh, distribution of the quantum data for a single qubit that I mentioned. So we can give this model quantum data points per top from training data points to, uh, to see if this, is, uh, this model can actually generalize. Because the actual, you know, that example was a bit artificial in a sense of a fixed uh, data point, quantum data point to our fixed direction A and B. Now using the standard Keras model, uh, we can uh, predict the, the function and see that the noise noisy samples are categorized with uh, enough accuracy. So basically, this is, uh, uh, has been a very long journey, and we had a big team to be able to bring this up to you. And we would like to thank our colleague uh, in our team, in particular the quantum team. Uh, uh, we had a contribution from X, Wolfswagen, and in particular, University of Waterloo. I want to mention a significant contribution from Michael, Antonio, Guillaume and Trevor uh, over the past two years. And uh, we will excited to see what you can do with this and we welcome your contributions. Um, so you can dig deeper by going to the website tensorflow.org slash quantum. Also you can look at our archive paper which is, uh, provides a detailed overview of the entire framework and also a lot of quantum applications that you can work the details in the uh, call app that are available in the TF uh, Quantum website. Thanks a lot for your attention.